evening. This is Frankly Speaking Live with your host, Frank Holzhauser, and my co-host, An Empty Chair. Uh, so David, uh, is, uh, apparently, um, on his way or there in the Black Hills in South Dakota, uh, visiting Mount Rushmore, and, um, if you'd like to see his lovely person, you'll have to tune in next week. So, <clears throat> we get started on our show this week, and, um, I, uh, think we'll be talking about marriage uh, we're going to talk about Lois Lerner, we're going to talk about some of Hillary and Hillary's fibs, and we're going to uh, talk about GM, General Motors, Government Motors, whatever you want to refer to it as, uh, their uh, financial woes and various issues. Uh, so we'll get started. Um, I posted this week on Facebook... Um, I start out by saying there's a movement afoot in certain churches that is very troublesome to me, and that is the notion that they only speak of God's love and want to ignore His law and His impending judgment. This is an enigma to me. The two are not and should not be mutually mutually exclusive. For instance, I love motorcyclists. But I would be remiss if I did not warn them of the dangers of not wearing a helmet. I love swimmers. Again, I would be shirking my duty not to tell them the danger of swimming in hazardous or shark-infested waters. You quickly get the point. I love hunters. But not to teach gun safety is fool's play. God loves the sinner, but hates the sin. So as followers, why should we be different? We can love the sinner and still uphold the law. And then I uh, went on to post, uh, I I usually get on a roll on a a certain topic, and I uh, start thinking, and the thoughts start coming to me, and I actually had a minister of the gospel to debate me last week that marriage was not an institution. When I asserted that the Sabbath and marriage were the two institutions that originated in Eden. Now, please, anyone who cares, please refer to any Bible dictionary first, and then Webster's Dictionary next. To institute is to originate an event that will last for generations. Wow, I'm the layperson. Uh, So I wanted to uh, talk about Uh, what Christ our Savior, Christ our Lord, had to say about marriage. And I was reading this week that um, the average person speaks enough words in one week to fill a book of 300 pages. So in a a 60-year lifespan, you would uh, apparently write 3,000 books. Now, that's the average person. I may be, I may speak to, uh, I, may, I may write double or triple that amount of books because I tend to talk a lot. But, uh, so it's, it's, it's silly to think that Christ in a three and a half year ministry, uh, all we have as a result is the four gospels of basically what Christ said. I mean, it's, it's silly to think that, um, he didn't write books upon books upon books upon books that haven't been recorded. But the Bible gives us, and Scripture gives us, a basic outline for uh, different topics, and marriage is one of them included that Christ talked about. So, Ryan, if you would pop up um, Matthew 19, we'll get started. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee, and it came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. And the Pharisees came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? 
And Christ answered and said unto them, Have ye not read, hang on here, that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Now, to stop here and pontificate for a second, I find nothing at all amb- ambiguous, ambigu- amb- ambiguous is the way I want to pronounce that, about uh, the statement that God made them male and female. It doesn't say he made them male and male. It doesn't say that he made them female and female. So what uh, started in the book of Genesis, which um, talked about that uh, God originated marriage in the garden, or a covenant, a marital covenant, whatever you want to call it, he united male and female. So going on in verse 5, it says, And said, For this cause shall, again, no ambiguity here, it doesn't say it, it doesn't say uh, a suggestion. It uses the word shall. It doesn't use uh, should, maybe, could, uh, a suggestion that a man leave his father. It's a it's a directive. It's 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 almost an order. God said, Christ said, for a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall twain and they Twain shall be one flesh. So hang on here, back up a little bit, okay? Um, So again, they're not individual persons. They come together and they become one flesh through procreation. Now, you can argue with my words— you can say I'm a narrow-minded, bigoted Christian who doesn't like homosexuality or doesn't believe in homosexual marriage, but basically we have an outline for what marriage is supposed to be. Christ himself said these words, and they were penned by his uh, apostles in the four Gospels, and it basically talks about that Out of this union, out of this marriage union, the two would cleave together and become one flesh. So um, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So I would take that a couple of ways, that uh, what, what God hath joined together, he joined together two things. He joined together male and female. He joined together husband and wife. So he's saying a couple of things in this verse uh, 6 here, that what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder, meaning that let no man change the definition of what I've joined together. I've joined together male and female. I didn't join together. He doesn't explicitly state this, but he's stating it in a roundabout way. Don't try to put together something I didn't join together. I joined a man and woman together. I joined husband and wife together. Let no man put this asunder. Then in verse 7, it goes on to say, They say unto him, roll up a little bit on me, uh, Why did Moses then command a writing of a divorcement and to put her away? And Christ said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. So we, hang on, verse 9, back up to verse 9. So we see that uh, divorce was not anything that God had planned from the beginning. Marriage was supposed to be a a permanent union, a permanent covenant that was supposed to last uh, till the end of time. And... Uh, divorce was something that came along after the fact, and uh, men and women got into unadvised marriages, unwise marriages, and because of the hardness of their heart, and uh, men and women didn't want to put away their differences, so uh, inevitably God had to, uh, when uh, the children in the wilderness under Moses, they had to 
uh, allow divorce. So it goes on in verse 9 to say, I say unto you, whosoever, whosoever shall put away his wife, except be it for fornication, and shall marry another, hang on, uh, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. So if one, if a, if a couple, what that is telling me is if a couple is married and one of them breaks the commitment, the covenant of marriage, the marital covenant, by a physical adultery, and, and adultery can also be uh, adultery with the other gods. So it doesn't have to be necessarily a physical adultery. It can be a spiritual faith adultery. But the person who commits that adultery, they go on and remarry in that adulterous relationship. They continue in their adultery. Now, the person who didn't commit the adultery and is left behind, according to this, is free to remarry. So, um, going up to verse 10, his disciples say unto him, in, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. But he said unto them, All man cannot receive this saying, save them to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were born which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there are eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. So back up just a little bit till I see the verse 12. Uh, I, I want to pick up on this eunuchs thing because I think this is an important point. Uh, I read a statistic somewhere here recently that um, potentially as, as many as one out of five babies are born as hermaphrodite, that uh, it's an undetermined sex. Now, I don't know that this is particularly what Christ was referring to here, but I think we can draw some inference from that, that uh, a eunuch is someone, it was particularly a male, who was um, castrated or born without testicles, which were made eunuchs of men, which men made some men eunuchs by castration so that there wouldn't be this uh, tremendous sexual drive, and these men eunuchs were generally put in charge of king's harems, and then, of course, the kings thought that they were pretty safe in that these eunuchs wouldn't be messing around sexually with the, their wives and concubines. So Christ, it, it's kind of funny to me, or interesting to me, I shouldn't say funny, but it's, it's, it's a point of interest to me that Christ mentioned this. Because we have a lot of um, sexual identity problems in this country that that, that um, boys and girls are born they don't totally they're not totally girls they're not totally boys they have to check their genetics their gene pool they have to figure out precisely what they are and it's it's a terrible thing to be a parent I would suggest and you're waiting for that moment when you are able to be told, um, do you have a boy or a girl? And the doctor says, well... So, um, we're coming up on the first break, and uh, after the break, I'll continue on uh, a couple of more verses in the Bible about what Christ had to say about marriage. But um, this has been Frankly Speaking Live with your host, Frank Holshauser, and my co-host, Empty Chair, this week. So... Um, We'll be back shortly. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Get away from us, you mean old credit card. We don't have any more money. We're in trouble now. Save us! Help! Somebody save us! Somebody help! Help! Save us! <laughs> 
I'm Tom Coach from Consumer Credit of Des Moines. If your credit card's a little too animated, give us a call. Hooray, we're saved! Consumer Credit, you're our hero! Hey, what's wrong? Logan wants Let's Rock Elmo for his birthday, but since Steve lost his job, I don't think we can afford it. What did you do for money last year when you and John were struggling to make ends meet? My secret? I went to me and mommy to be. We sold all of Megan and Ryan's clothes and toys there. They give back the highest percentage on their items in the area. And it was so easy. Megan's clothes? She's 15. Yes, they can sign newborn through trendy teens. We're not struggling now, but I'm going to keep saving and making money at me and mommy to be. Visit eMetroFord.com for your guaranteed credit approval. Good credit, bad credit, no credit. Everybody drives with guaranteed credit approval at eMetroFord.com. Visit eMetroFord.com today. If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. All across America, there are countless numbers of people struggling with addiction and other life-controlling issues. Probably someone you know and love. There is a way out. There is hope. Transformations Treatment Center in Delray Beach, Florida has a unique approach to substance abuse treatment. Call now and ask about our guaranteed success program or log on to transformationstreatment.com. Transformations. Change your life. Change your relationships transform your world. And we're back with Frankly Speaking Live. I'm your host, Frank Kohlshauser, and my normal cohort, David Kenyuk, is not here this week. He, I uh, believe, is vacationing in the Black Hills in South Dakota, visiting the uh, Mount Rushmore. So uh, potentially he may call, but um, I'm not going to hold my breath. Um, when we left for the break... Um, I was talking about uh, finishing up on Matthew 9, talking about the Unix, and I was mentioning that uh, one out of five children I've heard potentially are born hermaphrodite, which means they have uh, um, unsure of the sex, can, be, can look female, can look female, female or male, can look both. Sometimes it, uh, they need to wait till puberty to find out uh, potentially uh, how the child feels about their sex. So even Christ, I think, was referencing in this about eunuchs who were born a particular way, which is no excuse for uh, same-sex marriage. But uh, I'll, I'll go to continue here with something I uh, wrote, penned on Facebook this week, and... Um, I spoke recently of an effort in many churches to have a feel-good or watered-down message. It goes something like this. I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay. It's just about kindness and God's love. Again, being the layperson here, Jesus Christ, or our Savior, routinely called the scribes and Pharisees hypocrites and fools. Now, I don't know about you, but... Um, I I would not be envious of anybody who was called a hypocrite or a fool by Christ. And I sure I'm sure that I have been guilty of it, but I certainly wouldn't want Christ to say that to my face. But he then made many references throughout the New Testament to thieves, liars, 
murderers, adulterers, robbers, and the heathen. And John the Baptist called the folk of his day a generation, quote, a generation of vipers. Now, excuse me, but a viper is a venomous snake, sneaky, and lies in wait for a prey. Again, I love God's love. But I would not want Jesus to say any of those things to me. It's love, but for sure it's tough love. Now, I know some churches need butts in the seats to justify keeping the doors open and the lights on. But come on, if preachers don't know the basics, we're in for trouble. Yeah, no one says we shouldn't love the gay, but we can stand for marriage, one man, one woman, and still love the gays. These two are not, I repeat, not mutually exclusive. So, um, pop up that uh, second text in um, Matthew 22. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage but as are angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read which was spoken unto you by God? So, keeping this in mind, I wrote this. Something must be kept in mind when reading Matthew twenty two thirty. When Christ speaks to the Sadducees, uh, and to give a little history of of this, uh, the Sadducees, the scribes and Pharisees, and the Esnes, E S S N E S, they were a uh, Oh, kind of a mystical part of the Sanhedrin. But there was basically these groups of people on the Sanhedrin. There was uh, 70, 70 people on the Sanhedrin. And the scribes, or the Pharisees and the Sadducees were continually at odds and in bitter opposition on this uh, belief in the resurrection. So I write... the Sadducees, by saying, In the resurrection there is no marriage, but men are as angels. First, the council of Sanhedrin was made up of three sects. They were the Sadducees, scribes, Pharisees, and the Essenes. The high priest was usually a Sadducee, and they hated Christ with a passion. They probably hated Christ more so than any group of people on the Sanhedrin. And generally speaking, the high priest was a Sadducee, so Christ had his work cut out for him. And they were of Greek and Grecian influence, which kind of helps explain their unbelief in the doctrines of the resurrection of the dead, the afterlife, with its rewards or punishments, and the existence of angels. So when Christ speaks here in verse 30, he does, though, he, pardon me, he does so in their complete ignorance of Scripture. They were God guys. They believed in God, but they refused the working of the Holy Spirit. They kind of felt like man was self-contained, and contained in self, and self was all one needed to evolve. This is kind of the problem that Paul ran into amongst the Corinthians, was this belief that the, 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 the Greeks didn't quite understand in Corinth why Paul was so focused on Jesus Christ, the risen Jesus Christ, our Savior. They believed also in the evolution of man, but they, it, it was kind of a secular humanistic view that 
man could evolve, and it was all contained within himself. So what we need to focus on here in verse 30 is, is that um, they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe in the afterlife with its rewards or punishments, so I'm guessing they had a real issue with heaven and hell, or heaven and judgment. They were quizzing Christ that, well, you know, they thought if he was going to be resurrected in another physical body like we have now, that life would continue, life would go on, and you would uh, marry and remarry and, and, and potentially uh, continue in, in another physical body. And Christ set them straight right off the bat by saying, go back to uh, the Bible text, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are of angels of God in heaven. So um, you can you can uh, go back to the uh, screen. So basically, what he was uh, uh, telling them that um, that in heaven we're not going to marry in heaven. Now I hold out some hope. And I have no uh, a biblical, I guess, um, information to back this up, but I do have a conviction that while there may not be marriage in heaven, I don't necessarily know that there may not be marriage in the new earth, because obviously we spend as Christians a, a millennium in heaven, a thousand years, uh, for, you, uh, for those of you in Rio Linda, as my buddy Rush Limbaugh would like to say, and after uh, the resurrection of the dead and the judgment, uh, Christ will set up shop here and remake this earth new, and we will live on this earth for an eternity. So I'm not totally convinced, and I don't think there's any real large body of evidence one way or the other to prove that there won't be marriage again in heaven. But if there's not, I'm sure God will give us something to replace it. But Matthew 22.30 is no excuse and no excuse whatsoever to promote gay marriage, and it's certainly no excuse, in my opinion, to not hold up the law and to hold up marriage as one man and one woman. So, Ryan, pop up my final text in Matthew... Um, 2437. And I will see if I have... Okay. All right. Um, but as... And Christ is speaking here again. But as in the days of Noah were so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days of Noah that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage until the day... Okay, that's good. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. I think this is probably the most important um, words that Christ uh, uttered on the topic of marriage. And I want to point out that in Christ's day, the big battle was not same-sex marriage. The big battle was polygamy. Uh, by Cain's son Lamech, fifth descendant from Cain, was the one who, uh, by all intents and purposes, to my study and my understanding, is the one who engaged first in polygamy. Polygamy being multiple, multiple, uh, a man being married to multiple wives. So if you'll pop that verse up just for a brief second here, I just uh, want to emphasize, and they, and 
There's nothing wrong with eating. There's nothing wrong with drinking. And there's nothing wrong with marrying or, or giving in marriage. Okay, you can go back. But basically, you know, I'm not going to mince any words here. I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm, my show is called Frankly Speaking for a reason, and it's because I speak frank, and I, uh, I, I think a lot about what I say. I just don't talk and, uh, to hear myself talk. Uh, I go over this stuff and uh, rehearse it in my mind, I guess, and uh, I know precisely what I want to say, and I usually don't mince words when I want to say it. But, but basically, when he's talking about eating and drinking, we're talking about blood, blood thirst, blood lust, for eating raw flesh, uh, eating bloody flesh. Uh, the, the Jewish people were taught to, uh, to, to not eat bloody meats. They were, ta- they were taught to wash the meat. They were taught to cook the meat done. And uh, they weren't... Uh, but let's be clear here that uh, it was eating flesh meats, alcoholism, and... Um, being outside the guidelines of God's uh, union of marriage between one man and one woman. It was one man and multiple women and multiple concubines. So this has been uh, Frankly Speaking Live with your host, Frank Holzhauser, and my empty chair guest host this week. And we shall return after the break. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're going to do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do. And if we guarantee it's going to be a good experience for you, or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're going to do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you going to say that to a client? No. <laughs> you don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're going to be listening. They're going to want to know what your challenges are. Then they're going to come and give you options, and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family, you know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it, because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now, and then leave, and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed the day. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me. But is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did was perfect. It was great. <laughs> Keep going, though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed writer, it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. And 
we're back with Frankly Speaking Live, and I'm your host, Frank Holzhauser, and we're minus uh, my normal my normal cohort, co-host this week, David Kenyuk, who is vacationing in uh, the Mount Rushmore in the Black Hills. So I'm here soloing by my lonesome, and of course we have Ryan in the uh, producing the show, and... Um, so we've made it through the first half hour, and we've got, uh, I want to talk about in the last half hour, and I, I don't know how much uh, time, just play it by ear here, but I want to talk about the IRS and Lois Lerner. I want to talk about uh, some, some, some fibs of the prevaricator, Hillary Clinton, and I want to talk about GM's woes. So... I'll start out here by the Lois Lerner thing, and as many of you know who follow the news, that uh, the the IRS was targeting the Tea Party groups and holding up their approval for their 501c3s or c4s and um, asking them absurd questions and um, a a list of their donors and, uh, I I don't know, everything from... um, a right arm to their personal prayers, to their personal thoughts or whatever, to get approval. Uh, something tells me that they don't run the left-wing groups through the meat grinder, that they run the white right-wing groups through. But uh, nonetheless, the story has come out that uh, two years' worth of emails because of a hard drive crash, and let's face it, computers will crash. Uh, I, I've, I've been a few rounds in my life with uh, crashed hard drives, and I've had to reformat computers, and it's a very tricky thing not to uh, uh, permanently lose some things on a computer. But, a la, we have the NSA spying on all of us, so I don't know how necessarily any of this can be lost when the IRS, I'm sure, has, or the uh, NSA has copies of this. And obviously, these emails that Lois that was coming from Lois Lerner's office was forwarded to somebody. There's was, there was recipients of these emails, so I'm assuming the recipients of these emails have uh, copies and uh, carbon copies of various people who got these emails. So I don't buy this story at all that these emails are permanently lost. But hypocrisy. And I'll do my hypocrite of the week segment. Uh, since we've missed Hypocrite of the Week uh, the last couple of weeks, I'll incorporate my Hypocrite of the Week uh, right now. The IRS, the government. Any of you taxpayers out there who has ever been so unfortunate to be audited, I assume that it's not a very pleasant experience. And my, uh, you know, I, I know that the federal government can go back on you for seven years worth of records. Now, you can, as a taxpayer, you can amend three years of returns if you feel like you've got some money that uh, the government still owes you. You can go back on your uh, you know, income tax returns for three years and amend them and refile them to get back more money. But the government can come back on you for seven years. So right off the bat, it's an unequal, unfair system between the government and the taxpayer. Why not three years apiece? Why not seven years apiece? But, um, you know, what, 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 would, uh, what, what do you think the response of the government would be? What do you think the response of the IRS would be if you as a taxpayer, they come to you and audit you and said, well, my hard drive crashed. I, I, I can't produce these receipts. I, I photocopied them all on, uh, all on uh, my hard drive, and uh, I destroyed the originals, and my hard drive crashed, and sorry, I can't produce these receipts. You'll just have to take my word for it. Do you think that uh, there may be some jail time in your future? Do you think they may uh, come after you unduly for some taxes they think that you owe them? Um, you know, they're, they're not going to take that for an answer. They're not going to respect that for an answer that your hard drive crashed. But we as Americans are supposed to sit by and we're supposed to believe that the IRS lost these and they don't have no backup system. 
you know, they don't have LifeLock, they don't have any kind of a, a, a computer software program, or they don't have a server that saves some of this stuff or protects some of this stuff for them. It's just ludicrous to believe this story. It's a crock. It's a bunch of baloney. And even uh, my, my cohort, David Kenyuk, sent me an article saying that even CNN anchor John King scoffed at the IRS's excuse last week that over two years of emails from disgraced official Lois Lerner were inadvertently lost in a hard drive crash, joking you'd have to believe in Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny to believe that. Her emails were just suddenly poof. They're gone. King discussed the IRS explanation Monday morning with a CNN panel, noting that the Tax Revenue Service trotted out the story for over a year after Republicans initially requested Lerner's emails. As former head of the IRS exempt organization office, Lerner was accused of orchestrating a deliberate campaign targeting Tea Party and other conservative organizations for extra scrutiny. I'm not trying to be flippant here, and I don't mean to be flippant. Well, maybe I do mean to be, King began. Do you believe in the Easter Bunny? Do you believe in Santa Claus? Do you believe that Lois Lerner's emails suddenly went poof? King explained that even if you believe the hard drive crash was a horrible accident, it was hard to argue with the Michigan Republican lawmaker Dave's Camp, Dave Camp's anger over being told about the lost emails over a year into the investigation. Waiting a year to tell the Congress makes me suspicious. King goes on to say with his co-panelists that there's nothing good about the, the way this has been handled. AP reporter Julie Pace asserted it's hard to believe that in this era where you have uh, servers and backup servers and all kinds of technologies that can recover all kinds of emails, that these emails simply don't exist. If that's true and they don't exist, why was one of the first things they was told? Why wasn't that one of the first things that was told to Congress? Pace continued. Why didn't we have to go? Why did we have to go through these questions and raise suspicions after a year into it? So, you know. My response to this, uh, not being a fan of John King, and he uh, paneled one of the worst debates uh, that I had seen in the history of debates when he sighed, and uh, I believe it was a Republican debate, and uh, he wasn't getting the answers he was getting in the timely fashion that he should get them, and people were running over the time, and all he could do was sit in his chair and sigh. Uh but when a, when a blind squirrel like John King can say that uh, you have to believe in Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny to buy this story, uh, it, it tells me that um, the IRS and the, our government is full of baloney, and they need to step up and they need to give answers to the people that uh, deserve the answers. And my... Computer here seems to be moving slowly. I can get back to Facebook and I want to get to Hillary. Uh, I'm going to try to hit the GM woes last. Uh, so I'm going to blow through some of Hillary's. Uh, we, we discussed Hillary last week. And anybody that uh, wants to know anything about the Clintons, and I've likened it this way. Uh, if you had three people rob a bank, uh, two, were the, two were the robbers and one was the getaway driver. In the uh, trilogy of the Clintons, Dick Morris is that proverbial getaway driver. And he was a pollster. He was a personal advisor. Uh, he, you know, if Bill Clinton had his uh, something caught in the uh, pickle slicer, Dick Morris was the go-to man to find out a poll what the American people thought about particular said issue, and then Bill Clinton was advised what to do. So personally, I trust Dick Morris when it comes to the Clintons. Now, maybe I might not trust him on all things, but when it comes to the Clintons, he was the getaway driver from the time that they were in Arkansas as a governor and the first lady of Arkansas. But we, we spoke a little bit about some of uh, 
Hillary Clinton's issues with entitlement, and, and Dick Morris was on Hannity the other night and said the exact same thing I said last week. She is an entitlement-oriented person, and she prevaricates with the truth. But here's a couple of admitted lies that uh, I omitted to tell you about last week. According to Hillary, Chelsea Clinton was jogging around the Trade Center. The World Trade Centers on September 11, 2001, when the World Trade just before the World Trade Centers collapsed, and of course later to be found out that she was in bed watching it on TV. Hillary was named after Sir Edmund Hillary, and it was admitted later on that in fact she was wrong that he climbed Mount Everest five years after she was born. Obviously, I spoke of last week that she had opined that she was under sniper fire in Bosnia when, it, when their plane was coming in to uh, land. And um, a girl presented her with flowers at the foot of the ramp, so she certainly wasn't under fire. And, of course, I mentioned this a little bit last week, that she learned in the Wall Street Journal how to make a killing in the futures cattle's market uh, with her somewhere between $1,000 to $10,000 investment where she uh, made a cool 100000 Now, Dick goes on to mention many whoppers that she won't confess to, that she didn't know anything about the FALN pardons that helped her get elected uh, as senator of New York. She didn't know about her brothers being paid to get pardons uh, for certain pardons that Bill Clinton granted. Uh, she won't confess to taking the White House gifts that was a clerical error. She didn't know that her staff would fire the travel office after she told them to do so. She didn't know that Peter, that the Peter Paul fundraiser in Hollywood in 2000 cost 700 k more than she reported it. And, of course... She won't admit that she opposed NAFTA at the time, or she says that she opposed NAFTA at the time, and that's not the case. And she was instrumental in the Irish, Irish peace process, and she urged Bill to intervene in Rwanda, and so on and so on. And she played a role in the 90s economy, and the billing records showed up all on their own. And that she was always a Yankees fan. But we're coming up on our final break, and I want to get into this GM thing, and I hope we uh, have the time to cover everything I want to cover. This has been Frankly Speaking, and I'm your host, Frank Holzhauser, and we will return after the break. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Hey, psst. Let me let you in on a little secret. You ready? Always try to do business with people, not places especially if you seek honest Christian business people. And when it comes to my car, I really need to trust who's working on it. Now, my family is so blessed. A few years ago, we found a family-owned automobile repair shop that operates as a Christian business also. Open, honest, reliable, trustworthy. It's Amco on Hickman Road in front of Kmart. And it's a family-owned Christian operating business. This family treats your car as if it was their car. Everything from oil changes to transmission repair and everything in between. So the next time you feel the need to be at peace with your choice of who you can trust with your car, give Amco on Hickman a chance to serve you. And tell them Max sent you. All across America, there are countless numbers of people struggling with addiction and other life-controlling issues. Probably someone you know and love. There is a way out. There is hope. Transformations Treatment Center in Delray Beach, Florida has a unique approach to substance abuse treatment. Call now and ask about our guaranteed success program or log on to transformationstreatment.com. Transformations. Change your life. Change your relationships transform your world. Hey 
And we're back with Frankly Speaking Live. I'm your host, Frank Holzhauser, and Ryan producing, and David on vacation. So I've got a few minutes here left, and uh, if we run a few minutes over, uh, we won't have any music, but hopefully I want to get all this in. Uh, GM has had some some issues, and these issues aren't something that just happened um, recently. These go back to a book by... Uh, Marianne Keller called Rude Awakening back in 1989 uh, that started to uh, log the issues and problems that GM was having as far back as uh, the late 90s. But currently there is, uh, there's is there been 31 recalls this year of GM automobiles, and these recalls total 20 million cars under recall. Uh, 15 people have been released, uh, relieved of their duty. Of course, they floated off with their pensions and their golden parachutes. Uh, but there is 210,000 GM employees, and uh, the, the current CEO of uh, Abera, I can't think of her first name, but she has been an employee of GM for 30 years, and uh, she obviously references and makes a distinction between, quote, the old GM and the new GM. But we continue to have shoes that fall and these uh, uh, recalls of GM cars. And there has GM admits they're willing to admit to about uh, 13 deaths, deaths by their cars. Uh, other people say there may be as many as a couple hundred, and I would suggest that that number may be triple, a double or triple that. But uh, I remember watching a show. It's it's probably been a, at least ten years ago, but I remember watching a show on Sunday called Detroit Auto Line, and on that show they were talking that um, GM was losing. Well, I shouldn't say losing, but uh, the the average car coming off the assembly line, and I suppose that's a mix of the economy boxes, Corvettes, and high-dollar Cadillacs, but they were losing an average of $200 per unit coming off the assembly lines. Now, um, they said at the time that the only way that GM was making any money was through GMAC financing. Now, at the same time, uh, Chevrolet was cleaning up with uh, manufacturer's titles, driving titles on the NASCAR racing circuit. And you basically, for years and years and years, Ford won a few championships. Uh, I think Pontiac, which is a GM sister uh, a company. A Dodge won a championship here a couple of years ago. But basically speaking, for the last uh, 35 years, there's been uh, five Ford championships and a Dodge championship, so six championships that aren't GM. So basically 29 and 6 is uh, the record in the last 35 years. Uh, so basically, while all this was going on and all this crap was hitting the fan, the CEO says that this was a communication problem that the fact that they were cheapening the ignition switches with a uh, inferior spring and a 57 cents more in the spring would have made a difference in whether the cars were accidentally shut into the accessory position, uh, thus causing the airbags not to go off in a particular crash. But GM has acknowledged at least 13 deaths, but other people estimate that there may be hundreds, and I say the number the number could double or triple that. But being somebody who has some experience in working in the rental car industry, particularly for Hertz and Alamo, and I've drove cars all over this country for various car dealers, and I can tell you with authority that when I worked for the rental car agencies, I never took a, a Toyota car anywhere other than a body shop. Ford Motor Company was the best of the American-made manufacturers, and GM just had piddly, ridiculous stuff going on constantly with their trim, their fit, and their finish. And it was um, 
um, airbag lights, anti-lock brake lights, et cetera, um, little uh, pieces of plastic that held the mirror adjustments in and the little 25 cent piece of plastic would break causing the mirror adjuster to fall in the door and then the mechanic would of course have to take the door apart fish the uh, mirror adjuster back through the door but uh, being a NASCAR fan for over 50 years and uh you know, I basically, uh, and as a Ford fan, I've been basically have it shoved in my face for years that, uh, you know, you can't win without a GM. We, we basically have a car owner, Mr. Hendrick. I don't know if he is the, the Don of NASCAR, but everyone else can call people by their first or last names. But uh, Mr. Hendrick is referred to as Mr. So... And he has his own bag full of, 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 of felonies that was obviously bought himself uh, out of by uh, donating about $275,000 to the Clinton um, Library and Massage Parlor pun, uh, Fund, which uh, I guess probably got his right to vote and his right to own a, a firearm back. But uh, I read most of the people that got caught with similar felonies spent a minimum of five years in a, a federal penitentiary, and I think a Brother Rick got to spend about eight months in uh, home arrest with a bracelet on, an ankle bracelet on, until he uh, had to receive bone marrow uh, treatments, and then voila, he magically got released from his uh, home detention. Uh, the GM stuff, they have decent looks. They have some pretty peppy in, uh, engines, but their trim and fit and finish on their interiors is just junk. And anybody who has drove one, set in one, or knows anything about one, uh, should be able to attest, attest to this. I have a personal friend that says he'll never buy another GM product again in his life. He's going to tell Bill Moyer, to, uh, who is your, wants to be your dealer for life, that I'm not buying any more of your junk. But GM has tried to cut costs in uh, every avenue. And here's just a couple of quotes that I uh, get off a website called General Watch. It's GM shareholders watching General Motors. Here's a quote that says, um, as long as the unwritten rule stands, the best way to achieve success as GM is to be a good finance man. The bad habit of juggling numbers in order to present the picture the people want to see cannot be broken. By the end of 1985, its share, GMs, of the market had skidded down to 41%, dropping four points in two years as the all-new Ford Taurus and Sable created shockwaves throughout the auto industry and received rave reviews from the media and motorists alike. This was an embarrassing low that would have seemed impossible in 1980 when the market share was 46%. This is from the book Rude Awakening by Marianne Keller. But anyone who would like to read about uh, GM's problems, be sure and um, try to find this book, Rude Awakening, by Marianne Keller. Uh, she talks that this problem started in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. And she won't precisely say that uh, anybody done anything with the uh, Oh, what's the word I want to use? Uh, with evil intent, but uh, she she does not paint a picture that things were good at GM. They were doing everything they could to cut down their costs and uh, pass on a, uh, a a pile of junk to the consumer. And this cobalt, in which many of the deaths are related to, was precisely aimed at young girls from the age of 18 to 25. And I don't know how you would feel as a father, but if, if, if I was a father and I went out and purchased a car for my daughter because GM had uh, told me that this was a good, safe car and come to find out my child had been killed in it or severely injured, I as a father would be rather upset. So, you know, I don't believe that this stuff could be in a vacuum and in a stovepipe where nobody knew about. I think this was a widespread cult of corruption, culture of corruption at GM, and I believe that um, 
more than just 15 people knew about it. So uh, we'll probably run just a minute or two here after the show and um, just mention that, uh, you know, from from Rick Wagoner to the, um, and the name escapes me, I'll have to do some housekeeping uh, at uh, next week, uh, but uh, the person who used to be in charge of uh, GM motor racing, uh I get great offense of being having my boot peed in, and then somebody telling me it's raining. And uh, Rick Wagner, this the former CEO, and some of the people at GM who floated off with their golden parachutes and rough run rough shot over NASCAR racing for the past thirty some years, while uh, a company like Ford, who has over six hundred wins in the series, uh, barely can eke out a handful of wins a year. They want to pee down your boot and tell you that their stuff is the best stuff on the road and GM is into safety and all kinds of uh, innovation and uh, kind of find out that it's just a bunch of baloney. So uh, hopefully next week we will be here again same time and um, David uh, Kanuke will join us next week. So this has been Frankly Speaking live with your host Frank Holshauser and I shall see you next week.